revisiting the KB Lake CPUs to take a look at the more likely purchase for the majority of gamers, the Intel i5-7600K quad-core variant. We previously reviewed the i7-7700K and found the CPU to be largely uninspiring with regard to out-of-box performance gains in gaming, though did remark that its render gains were more meaningful. Now we're looking at the 7600K to see how the processor moves Intel's i5 series forward. Before getting to that, this content is brought to you by our Patreon backers. You can go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus to help out directly. We just reached one of our goals and are producing some more interview content pieces, so check that out to help further. Running through the specs first, the Intel i5-7600K is what you would expect for an i5 CPU. It's four cores, four threads, no hyper-threading and is using 14 nanometer process, but it is Intel's 14 nanometer plus process, which increases the fin height and widens the gate pitch. And as we discuss in the 7700K review, that improvement is really just what gets them a couple hundred megahertz extra out of the clock. So uh, really the main gains for Kaby Lake over Sky Lake, just to cover it again, is going to be in the frequency department, other than some really specific things like 4K, Netflix, playback. Like other k SKU CPUs, the 7600K is fully overclockable and pairs best with the Z-Series motherboards. We've already detailed the new 200 series chipsets in our 7700K review again. Click the link in the description below for more information on the chipsets. As for the 7600K specs, we have a base clock of 3.8 gigahertz and a turbo clock of 4.2. The cache is reduced two megabytes in total cache from the i7, dropping to six megabytes from eight. And otherwise, it's largely the same specs and compatibilities. The biggest change, as always, is the halved thread count and reduced frequency from the i7 family. For details on the KB Lake architecture, check the link in the description below because that's got all of the benchmarks uh, in terms of the actual systems we use, the benches, defined in the methodology section. It changes, obviously, from one CPU to the next because you've got to account for a different memory compatibility, DDR4 or 3. And then the architecture itself is defined in the 7700K review, won't be going over that again today, uh, but we can go through the thermals, blender benchmarks, some synthetics, and then game benchmarks. Temperatures with our i5-7600K were a bit better than what we saw with the 7700K, depending on voltage, auto v-core, things like that. That was all discussed in the motherboard reviews, by the way. But for now, what we're seeing is a 74C package temperature went under the same load that the 7700K was under with AVX workloads. Cores zero through three, were in the range of 67 to 74 Celsius. And then the power draw was rated at 97 to about 101 watts or thereabouts. V-Core we keep at 1.288, it was manually tuned for these numbers. And then ambient was somewhere around 25, which is important to note as well. And just for what it's worth, the liquid temperature was 33 Celsius for the Kraken X62 that we used, which was a bit warmer than we saw with the 7700K, and that's just because the ambient was a bit increased during these tests, hence the value of our normal delta numbers. Using our in-house designed Blender benchmark as built by GN's Andrew Coleman, we're recording a total render time on the CPU of approximately 68 minutes with the stock configuration, or 62.5 with the 4.7 gigahertz overclocked version. As this benchmark demonstrates, having the additional threads helps in render workloads as the tool can render two times as many tiles simultaneously. The 7600K takes just under 30 minutes longer to render the scene than the stock 7700K and is expectedly slower than all i7 CPUs on the bench other than the aged 2600K. Compared to last generation's i5-6600K, the 7600K sees an improvement of approximately five to six minutes or about 7%. Moving on to synthetics prior to game benchmarks, Cinebench testing places the i5-7600K between the i5-6600K and the i7-4790K, and that's with 716 CB marks for CPU performance and 184 marks for single-threaded performance. Comparatively, our overclock boosts that up to 788 for total CPU performance, still below the 4790K and 204 for single threaded performance or just below the 7700K 5.1 gigahertz. The i5-6600K from last generation operated at 664 CB marks or 172 single threaded. For 3D Mark Fire Strike and Time Spy tests, again, link in the description below has those if you want more synthetics. But now we can move on to game FPS benchmarks. For these, we have a mix of CPU bound games and mixed workload games. Watch Dogs 2 is one to really pay attention to here because the threads really matter in that game, as we just explained in one of our optimizations guides. 
And then Total War, of course, is interesting as well because it is a CPU bound title. We recently posted a Watch Dogs 2 CPU optimization guide for graphics settings as the game has proven to be one of the few titles that takes advantage of additional threads from higher end CPUs. The line dividing i7 and i5 CPUs here is clear, with i7 CPUs dating back to Devil's Canyon overtaking and outranking even the i5 7600K. Even with its overclock 4.7 GHz configuration, we're still seeing it beaten by i7s for the most part. We're also seeing an average FPS of about 93 for the OC 7600K, with the lows tightly timed as shown with other CPUs. The non-overclocked version rests at 84 FPS average, and the Intel i7 7700K stock operates at 113 average, so we've got a gap of about 20 FPS between the two stock Kaby Lake CPUs. Looking at the previous generation, the i5 6600K operates at around 79 FPS average, so we're gaining approximately 5 to 6 FPS generationally. That's a gain of about 7%, which in this game anyway is sadly pretty good for this generation of Intel CPUs. For Battlefield 1, we're seeing the Intel 7600K stock land at around 141 FPS average, roughly equal to the 6700K i7 from last generation. To be fair, it's also roughly equal to the 7700K from this generation, which also caps around 141 FPS average. Compared to the i5 6600K, there's not a ton of improvement. We're moving from 137 average to 140.5, or a gain of about 2.5%, so not that exciting. We only start seeing meaningful gaps once down to the 3570K, but even that's not very relevant unless dying for 144 hertz gameplay. Total War has always been a CPU intensive title, well, all of them really, and that continues to be shown with Total War Warhammer. As noted previously, the frame times have larger range in Total War than we're used to, so the 0.1% values aren't quite as valuable as normally just because it is a bit more variable in its performance. Overall, we're seeing large scalability over the generations of i5 CPUs in this benchmark, with the 7600K stock landing at 165 FPS average and the 6600K stock landing about 10 FPS below that. The i5 4690K from Devil's Canyon operates around 143 FPS average, so we're at about a 10, 10, 10 FPS scaling to each one, with the 3570K at 99 FPS average. The scaling here shows that there would be a major benefit of upgrade for this particular title if moving up from Ivy Bridge or prior, but not so much excitement beyond that. The overclock 7600K, by the way, shows that frequency matters with Total War and plants us at around 177 FPS average. Ashes of Singularity's CPU-focused benchmark provides a look at DX12 performance with a title that's well-optimized for the new API. The 7600K stock performs just ahead of the 6600K and just below the 4790K i7 CPU. That's about the same as we've seen in terms of placement with the other games thus far. And moving to the overclocked variant of the 7600K, we're posting an FPS that is still below the 4790K, but it is getting a bit close with the next step up. As for overclocking, the 7700K that we worked with, both of them actually, were a lot more exciting than the 7600K. We were able to hit 5 to 5.1 gigahertz on the i7 variants of Kaby Lake, depending on which one we were working with. And that really wasn't that hard. We used a liquid cooler for it, of course, because it was kind of required at that point. But even using the same liquid cooler for this one, same methodology, same motherboard even, which was the Z270 Gaming Pro Carbon, we're still only hitting, only hitting 4.7 gigahertz on the i5 7600K. With 1.4 volts, I was kind of able to get some stability with 4.8 gigahertz but uh, that was really pushing the voltage that I was comfortable with. And beyond that, you start running into some pretty serious temperature issues and there was just stability issues all around. So 4.7 was the number we got with our particular sample of the 7600K and ours was a retail sample, I bought it. So if that's worth noting, I guess it's out there. Uh, it was not provided, so it definitely wasn't handpicked or anything like that. The 7600K overall has about the same conclusion as the 7700K which is if you own Skylake or Devil's Canyon or Haswell, there's really no reason to upgrade for the most part, especially for gaming. Now, if you're doing things like animations, like the Blender rendering, there might be a reason to upgrade, but gaming, not really. It's kind of a hard sell, even with the CPU intensive titles like Total War. Watch Dogs i5 to i7 would get you a lot more than i5 to new i5. Other than that, if you're on something as old as Ivy Bridge or older than that, it's probably worth considering an upgrade, but again, at this point, I would say just wait around a bit. We'll see how Zen performs. Normally, we don't recommend waiting, but because Zen is so close and it's been on the radar for years at this point, 
might as well and see how it goes. At that point, it's worth looking at what the uh, decision would be for an upgrade. But for now, no real reason if you're on Skylake Caswell, Devil's Canyon, uh, maybe Ivy Bridge, as we've come to expect with the Intel generational steps. So thank you for watching. As always, Patreon link in the post roll video to help us out directly or patreon.com slash gamersnexus. You can check out the full article with a couple of extra synthetics at gamersnexus.net or in the link in the description below. Subscribe for more. I'll see you all next time.